I'm Andy Agathangelo, the founder of the Transparency Task Force. The Transparency Task Force is a certified social enterprise with a mission. Our mission, our formal mission is to promote ongoing reform of the financial sector so that it serves society better. And the reason we're focused on this topic of financial reform is because we really do believe that the financial industry is profoundly important to the well-being of society, to economic stability and to political stability as well. Unfortunately, our belief is that the financial industry will, at every opportunity given to it, it will misbehave because the profit motives are so strong within the financial industry, it's really quite hard to get it to behave itself. And of course, that manifests itself in many, many ways, including from time to time, a global financial crisis here or there. Today's topic is, I think, remarkably important because of where the UK is right now post-Brexit. Um, British politics and large parts of the British society are if you like, under the spell of a dominant financial narrative, that the City of London Financial Centre is pretty much the, uh, uh, the, the, the goose that lays the golden eggs or the engine of the British economy. Every time there is talk about regulating the city or getting it to behave better, somebody somewhere with a lot of power and a lot of influence starts talking about, yes, but it provides so many jobs and yes, it provides so many so much revenue to the exchequer. How will the UK survive if it doesn't let its financial centre uh, roam free and, and, and run at, 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 uh, at, at, at its desires? So right now, because of Brexit, which is being taken as an opportunity to rewrite the financial regulatory framework, there's this huge appetite in the city of London to push forward a pro-competitiveness agenda, which many people think including, of course, Nicholas himself, uh, is something of a Trojan horse for deregulation. <coughs> and some people, putting it very bluntly, very simply, see deregulation as a license to exploit. Um, the counter-argument for the city, of course, is that if we choke the city with needless red tape and European-style bureaucracy, uh, all the money is just going to run away to Singapore, Geneva, or the Cayman Islands, and we'll all be poorer as a consequence of it. Now many many people have all kinds of um, all kinds of perspectives and um, opinions about this matter. I personally think we are particularly fortunate today to be hearing from Nicholas Jackson. He's a journalist, an author, he's written for the FT, the New York Times, The Guardian, The Economist, Vanity Fair, Washington Post, uh, the Foreign Affairs, IMF and many others. Uh, he's the author of uh, Poisoned Wells, which is a book all about oil and politics in West Africa. He's the author of Treasure Islands, a book about tax havens and the finance curse, particularly relevant to today's session, because that's all about oversized financial centres. Nicholas is also the co-founder of the Balanced Economy Project, which I'm sure Nicholas will hopefully take the opportunity to tell us a little bit more about as we go through the session. Mm -hmm. So Nicholas, thank you very much indeed from me and from in fact all of us for being here and for being part of today's uh, conversation. I really, really do think, Nicholas, that this is an incredibly important topic. I'm genuinely worried that UK PLC is moving in the wrong direction. And uh, without being too depressing about it, um, if the wrong decisions are made and are continued to be made, we're going to end up with a, an economic system and, if you like, even a social system that's kind of all horribly, horribly, horribly out of balance and skewed in the wrong direction. Those are my introductory thoughts. Um, Nicholas, over to you, sir, to pick things up from here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, great to talk to you. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, the origins of the Finance Co story, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about my background and how, how we came here. I'm, as Andy mentioned, a journalist by background. Um, I cut my teeth in the oil producing countries of uh, West Africa and from the countries up from Angola up to Nigeria. And um, I was looking at this <coughs> phenomenon called the resource curse, um, where com countries that produce a lot of minerals like oil, um, and there was just beginning to come some academic research in this area, but I saw it firsthand in Angola in particular during the civil war. Um, the resource curse basically says, all this money coming into these countries not only doesn't seem to be being used properly for development, um, obviously, you know, corrupt leaders steal it and so on, but it seems to be in several cases even worse than that. These countries seem to be even poorer, even more conflicted, even more authoritarian than peer countries, other countries in Africa that you might compare, compare them with that didn't have national, natural resources. There's it, and, and, uh, academics are calling it the paradox of poverty from plenty. That, so that's the first, <coughs> and I spent a lot of time working in this area. And then in about 2006, I came across a guy called John Christensen, who was the former economic advisor to the British tax haven of Jersey. So Jersey's a big financial center, an offshore financial center. And he was, um, uh, we began working together. We began sort of, um, he was campaigning against tax havens and I actually joined him in that and um, that the fruit of that was Treasure Islands, my book about tax havens, which came out a bit over a decade ago. He had been, um, part of his job was to try and, you know, make life better for ordinary Jersey people. And he was very conscious of how the financial sector was making it very difficult in many respects um, for large parts of the population. It was, for example, sucking all the best and most educated people out of, um, you know, agricultural tourism or whatever, and into, <coughs> into the financial sector. It was creating terrible corruption um, at the top of the political system. Um, it was raising price levels, which meant that local kind of alternative sectors were finding it difficult to compete and all sorts of other things. And these phenomena that John was describing about Jersey were very familiar to me, having worked on resources, natural resources in um, troubled West African countries. There was the same <coughs> kind of rent seeking corruption you know, when, when you have a lot of money coming in from an oil sector. Um, there was the same brain drain, the sort of sucking of the most talented people out into oil and oil dependent sectors. Um, and there was the Dutch disease effect. These are all very well studied where price levels um, go higher and make it harder for other sectors to um, uh, compete with imported stuff. And, I, you know, I, I could I could go to the local market in Angola, for example, when I was living there and I could buy a chicken imported from Brazil that was cheaper than what I would have paid if it had been a locally grown chicken. Um, so there, there was all sorts of odd stuff going on, but John and I quickly realized that there were a lot of similarities between a, having a country with a, with a sort of very large financial center and uh, countries <coughs> that have are dependent on minerals like oil. So we started exploring this. He, John had already for some time before I met him been calling it the Jersey disease, um, but I persuaded him that finance curse was probably a better one because it was broad based. And we both agreed that this probably was a problem a phenomenon that applied to our own country, Britain. Um, so we started looking at it. We, we actually put out a first um, sort of conceptual document in, in 2013 <coughs> about the finance curse. Now, um, I'm going to give you a presentation. It's, it's a fairly long presentation, so I'm going to skip through um, a number of the slides. Um, but also, I think it would be good because it's fairly long for people to please raise your hands if you want to make a point, whatever. I'll, in the middle of it, I'll sort of, you know, have five minutes for questions and then we can carry on if that's OK with everybody. Um, but I'm going to now start my presentation. Uh, you should be able to see it. Right. Is that can you all see that? Mm -hmm. OK, so. I'm going to start with some conceptual ideas about the finance curse. Um, I'm calling it food for thought. You'll see why. The first food um, is uh, the fried egg. And this is the image, basically the idea. I think probably anybody on this call would accept that the financial sector has very useful parts that we all need. And it also has parts that are harmful in some way, predatory or dangerous or risky, destabilizing, etc. <laughs> so we have, um, you know, on the useful side, it's fairly obvious, you know, lending to, to productive firms and, and savings, you know, channeling savings into investment and so on. 
and the harmful stuff we're also very familiar with it um you know too big to fail banking the stuff that led to the last global financial crisis um corrupt money and so on so that's the first food for thought about the finance curse and that's uh, part of the concept um i'm now trying to write uh, the second one is the banana of finance. Now, this is a graph from the IMF, and there's been quite a lot of academic research. It is contested, but there is there are a fair number of papers have come out showing this kind of banana-shaped relationship. And what this um, graph does, it, it, it charts economic growth against levels of financial development. So if you are a country with a very, very underdeveloped financial center, you can, by developing your financial center, getting it to do more things that your economy needs, you can make your economy grow faster. And so um, the more you develop your financial sector, the more your financial sector will support growth. But there seems to be <laughs> um, significant correlations um, internationally that suggest that your financial sector can get to a kind of optimal point where it's doing all the things it's supposed to be doing. And if you keep growing your financial sector, if it gets even more developed after that sort of optimal point, then it starts to actually reduce economic growth. You get lower um, economic growth. And the, the uh, this literature is called the too much finance literature. As I mentioned, there's lots of different opinions about it. Um, but I think, uh, you know, th there is clearly going to be something to this, to this relationship. And the research provides some very interesting starting points for this. This is a third piece of food that I'd like to show. And this is just some really striking data that I pulled out of the Bank of England databases that is quite hard. You have to work quite hard to get this stuff. Um, but basically, this is who are UK financial institutions lending to? Well, if you look at the top, manufacturing is this tiny little um, sort of orangey brown slice. Um, whole, you know, the retail wholesale sector is similarly sized. Pretty small. I think manufacturing is about 4% of total UK bank lending. Then the, the bigger <laughs> brown slice is, is just other, other sectors that I've amalgamated together, right? They're just to make the graph look simpler. And then you've got this massive green slab. Um, who are UK banks lending to? They are lending back into the financial sector. That is the large majority of what they're doing. Um, a big chunk of that is real estate. About a third of this green slab is real estate. And the rest of it is just finance lending back into finance. Um, so there's an enormous amount of activity that isn't obviously directly supporting the rest of the economy. Um, and this needs a lot of further investigation. And that's a, there's a great research agenda to go with this. So that's so we've had the fried egg of finance, the banana of finance, and now the pie of finance. Um, so just to summarize, <coughs> every country needs a financial sector, but it can grow too big. And um, the sort of corollary of this is if your financial sector is too big, then if you shrink it and shrink it in smart ways, in the right ways, um, you will become more prosperous as a result. So it's kind of like it, it sounds paradoxical, shrink finance for prosperity. But that is a kind of slogan slogan associated with the finance curse. Um, so just to sort of make a different just to look at it from a different way i mean i have conceptualized it in relation to tax havens as, as i mentioned tax havens are you know important offshore financial centers um a tax haven you could describe it as a financial center that transmits or can transmit harm outwards to other countries so if you know the british virgin islands has got very strong sort of shell companies selling secrecy and Brazilian politicians can go there and hide all their money and loot their country and so on. So in this case, British Virgin Islands would be transmitting harm to Brazil. So these are tax havens is a financial center transmitting harm outwards to other countries. The finance curse thesis says that your own financial center, your domestic financial center, so the, the city of London in the, in the UK's case, can, by being too big and doing the wrong things, transmit harm inwards to the rest of the economy, to other parts of the economy. Um, so um, yeah, again, here, here we are, the, the apparent paradox, too much finance makes you poorer. Um, it's the flip side of shrink finance for prosperity, which is the kind of um, finance curse slogan. Um, so that's the kind of conceptual side of this. Um, and I, yeah, going back to my time in Angola, um, the oil industry there was, <laughs> was Angola was very much suffering from a strong version of the finance, finance curse. It was definitely worse off as a result of its natural resources. Um, 
there was a civil war going on at the time, but oil and diamonds um, contributed strongly to both the motivations and the resources available to the combatants. And, um, and also the sort of Cold War motivation as well. Oil was definitely feeding the civil war in various, in various different levels. Um, and I think <laughs> finance can also, an overly finance dependent country as the UK is, can also suffer all sorts of harms um, that bear a lot of similarities, not entirely similar. There, there's a decent overlap with between the finance curse and the resource curse. So what are the costs? You know, how much, how much is it costing the UK that there is excess finance? How do you measure excess finance? Well, it's obviously a very imprecise science and there's a lot of disagreement, um, but here are some some studies. There are a few studies. Um, this one I'm sh showing, Arkan, it's an IMF study um, that suggested that, again, they, they produced a banana, one of these banana shaped graphs. And, and the top of it was when credit to the private sector reached about 100% of GDP. Um, sorry, I have gone forward there. This graph underneath it is showing the UK economy, um, and this is credit to the to the non-financial sector as a share of GDP. And as you can see, it passed the um, passed the hundred percent mark somewhere around you know nineteen ninety, and now it's um, well above that 180 percent of GDP. Again, this is very imprecise, but it does suggest that if you take these studies at face value, that the UK's financial sector is far too big. Um, does anybody have any questions at this stage? Um, anybody want to make any points, thoughts? Maybe just one question. Does, yeah. the, does the data that you just sharing, is that because obviously one of the issues the UK has is it, it has a large domestic banking system, but it also hosts a very large international yeah. banking system. So if that a lot of the credit that goes through London isn't going to UK, it's going to other yeah. economies and things. So. Yeah. Does the data distinguish between yeah. that? That particular study will be a domestic, um, uh, domestically focused study credit. Okay. To the non so it will, it will split out. Yeah. Okay. It will split it out. And in, so in fact, um, on that study, the, the international stuff would be uh, even bigger yeah. Um, yeah. than yeah. what is shown in that graph. Um, other studies that measure different things would reflect the international stuff as well. And we'll talk about, so there, Andy introduced the idea of competitiveness. It's something that I've spent a lot of time working on and I'm not gonna get too detailed in competitiveness in the slides, but um, this issue of international versus domestic is absolutely crucial. And I hope we can discuss it in discussion after the, after the event, um, sorry, after the slides. Um, so a couple of academics um, made attempts to look at what is the cost of excess finance, not, not what's the cost of your financial center, but what's the cost of having a financial center so, you know, a certain amount above um, where it should be, ideally. <laughs> and here are some pretty, here's a big, it's a study that um, Gerald Epstein and um, uh, Juan Montesino made for the Roosevelt Institute. Um, this is a few years old now, um, but they came up with a very large um, sum. This has been, uh, uh, it was quite widely publicized this between 13 and sort of 23 trillion US dollars over 1990 to 2023. Um, and this, this kind of had three components. One was um, excess profits, stuff that, that had been kind of sucked out of other parts of the economy. There's lots of predatory parts of the financial sector private equity, certain parts of the private equity industry, for example, and many others, um, plus misallocation costs. So things, you know, things like people being sucked, you know, educated people being sucked out of other activities um, into finance to instead of, you know, finding a cure for cancer, they're working for <coughs> hedge funds doing, you know, complicated derivatives transactions that end up being very risky and dangerous. Um, and of course, the crisis costs. Um, and they separated those out basically by um, measuring the crisis costs. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, th th there's some complications there. But anyway, they, they separated those three components out and they came up with these very large figures. Um, Gerald Epstein came together with um, Andrew Baker of Sheffield University um, to do a similar exercise for the UK. And they came up with a four and a half trillion pound figure between 1995 and 2015. Um, that's the sort of cumulative total costs to the UK of 
excess finance. Again, relying on these kind of assumptions that you have this banana shaped graph and um, you know, there's lots of arguments and uh, disagreement about where the, where the line lies. But these are very, very hefty costs, and um, these are easily comparable, and if not bigger than the costs of um, Brexit, for example, which have been, you know, measures that are coming out of that now. Um, here's another sort of illustrative graph. This is um, uh, this is median incomes for people in the UK, um, and what this shows is if you look, you come up to the time of the financial global great global financial crisis, sort of sometime around. 2007. In fact, before the crisis, the UK was, you could argue that UK was growing a little bit faster, maybe than its peers that may have been, you know, sort of financial froth coming in ahead of the crisis. And then afterwards, a ma massive hit to growth compared to the other to the other countries. And the other country in this um, graph, which has also under underperformed its peers, its European peers after the crisis is Ireland, which is another refinance dependent country. So again, this doesn't, you know, uh, conclusively prove anything, but it's another good illustration that um, something has gone wrong, and and that cutoff time when everything um, seemed to diverge really does suggest that the financial sector has got a role to play in the UK's famously poor. Now everybody, all the economists, are worrying about what are we going to do about the UK's productivity performance? Why is it doing so much worse than others? Um, and a lot of people are blaming it on Brexit, but in fact, if you look here, this is older than Brexit, the, the, the really big hit to UK productivity and incomes and growth and so on. Here is another graph that tells a similar story. Um, and this is, you know, you would think a country with a big financial sector would be good at getting investment in. You would think that investment would be boosted by having a big financial sector. But this tells the opposite story. This is um, a recent story by Martin Wolf in the Financial Times. Look at the share of investment <laughs> in GDP relative to other, you know, other comparable countries. And the UK is right at the bottom. Um, much lower investment rates than, than, you know, France, Germany, South Korea, and so on. So here are more signs that the financial sector is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's doing something else. So, um, before I start, anything else anybody wants to say or ask? A thought just coming to my mind, Nicholas, about the difference between making money and earning money. Um, it's just a, a fresh thought that's come into my mind. I'm wondering about the extent to which the UK has, if you like, an overdeveloped finance sector, because in the 70s, we kind of destroyed our manufacturing base, and that void is perhaps being filled by this um, mushrooming finance sector. And if we think about manufacturing as earning money, the finance sector tends to kind of make money quite literally. There's a bit of a subtle difference between the two. That just thought popped into my mind off the back of your, off the back of your slides. Um, I wonder if that's part of the issue that we've, cr we've created voids that the finance sector is moving into because we destroyed so much of our manufacturing base. Uh, let me tell you, I'll tell you, can I just tell you one little story from a very famous man, um, mm -hmm. Terry Leahy. Terry Leahy ran mm -hmm. Tesco and was very successful. And I got to know him when he bought, he decided to buy Tesco. The buy, it, it, interestingly, it looks like they're going to reverse it, but they decided to buy Tesco Bank off RBS effectively. And the reason he did it was he said, look, we're the dominant retailer in the UK, but as I look at strategy, as I look at long term, as economies get more and more advanced, the proportion of GDP that is in services goes up and up and up, and that which is in manufacturers and hard goods goes down and down and down. And I don't want to be the dominant player in a shrinking proportion of the pie. I want to get more into services. So that's why he does. That's why Tesco do telephones because that's a service. That's why they do banking, that insurance, that's a service. So. So I think it there is something about the the UK US you know we are quite advanced economies and, and a lot of our economy is in services but they do earn money and you're wrong to think they don't earn money mm. I get paid money all the time from people overseas for providing services so you know and that happens at the macro level of course as well Thanks, Ian. I think Martin's put his hand up as well Martin why don't you come in there as well yeah. then we'll jump back to Nicholas thank you Yeah thank you um First of all, apologies for no picture, um, a bit of a pickle right now. And I joined late, 
I've only been on the call about five or so minutes. Um, big apologies. I, I I had my phone, my, my my watch on, except I didn't realize I was on dual time. And so I was half an hour out. So apologies for that. Um, um, I won an essay competition at the Institute of Actors recently. And it was called the Reddington Prize. And the uh, objective of the competition was to get ideas for improving the financial sector in the public interest. And my essay was, I suspect, all about what's been talked about here. And my basic thesis is that a large amount of the financial sector makes its money not competing properly with each other, but competing to trick the customers out of their money because the customers don't understand enough. And um, I, I gave evidence that this issue has been one which is in the public domain all the time. Every now and then, uh, every 10 years or so, there's a bit of a scandal and Parliament decides to do something and have an inquiry. And then the require inquiry always, always recommends something like fiduciary responsibility be introduced. Industry always avoids it and back we go again. Um, and so my whole idea is, oh, thank you for putting that up, Andy. My whole idea is the only way of attacking this is going to be a sort of guerrilla campaign. Now, you will not get money from the financial sector or from the business sector from saying, we want to empower people to understand things and take more an interest in how the whole country has run. Um, because I don't think it's just about people not getting ripped off. Um, and I think it's also about the power of the financial sector and the way in which what the financial sector decides should get a well done drives lower investment and drives less socially useful business, etc. And my nice, simple idea, and my first time I, I had an outing for this idea, and the, the, the campaign, I call it Save Us Take Control, was actually at, at, an, at an event hosted by Andy. So I'm very grateful for Andy for that. Um, it was an event that was called something like 10 years on from Northern Rock, what do we do? I think. Um, and my basic idea is that the only people who really know the truth, the truth you need to know, work in the financial sector itself. And those individuals um, are not allowed to speak up in the public interest until they're retired. Mm. So basically, as it happens, I work for a company where the boss uh, Martin, would agree Martin, with this. Martin, in the interest of time, we're going to move on from there, but you've, you've, you've made your point very well. But we're no, going to jump back to Nicholas. Perfect. Thank you, thank you Andy. Thank you. You're, you're, you're welcome, Martin. Nicholas, back to you, sir. Thank you. Great. OK, that's a lot of um, very good points and um, some really meaty things to talk about. Um, on Andy's point, yeah, I, I totally agree that there has been a, um, uh, you know, this idea of earning money, making money versus, um, how did he put it, deal making or whatever. Um, but I think, so one thing I, <laughs> I would say about that is that, um, yeah, manufacturing is a very tangible thing and it's very easy for people to understand. I think there is, you know, there is a lot to be said for services and I separate out non-financial services from financial services here so there's lots of non-financial services like you know filmmaking making you know britain is brilliant and making you know documentary programs and and music and and cultural services and lots of other you know accounting services and so on and then there are financial services and yeah, that's a, I mean, it's kind of like a whole can of worms. What financial services are useful and which ones are not? We're going back to the Friday picture here. Um, and I think there has been a really significant shift, particularly since the 1970s, towards um, the kind of deal making approach to it. So, in the, so just to take the simple example of a bank, um, you know, many decades ago, the kind of key activity of a bank would be to take money in from depositors. Um, and pay whatever, you know, 5% and lend it out to investors at, say, 10%. And they'd make, you know, they'd make money with the difference of that. But under that formula, they had to kind of really, the people who were borrowing from them, whether it's small businesses or whoever, they really had to know them. And they really had to sort of analyze them, make sure they were going to get their money back. It was very important that they got their money back. Um, now we've moved, moved much more to a kind of re, repackage and deal making um, 
system of banking where you make these loans and then you quickly sort of sell them off to someone else. And that goes down a daisy chain um, and it gets packaged up. And we, we ended up with a lot of, of these kind of um, financial packages turn coming to grief um, in the global financial crisis. And we are still suffering the after effects of that. And now we're in a new potential crisis. So I think there is a lot to be said for, for that being part of the answer. Um, and going to Ian's point about um, about uh, the yeah services again, um, I think that you know again going back to my point, I think we need to be careful of what what services we're talking about. I think often financial services get lumped together with other forms of services, and we do need to strip them out. And we, then we need to strip out financial services um, from. It depends, you know, if you're taking an economist perspective, that's one thing. If you're worried about the the you know the current account balance, the trade balance, and so on. Um, you will, you know, it's fine to lump them together. But if you're trying to work out what works and what's good for the economy, and what isn't, then I think you need to you need to start separating these things out. Um, so let me give you some example of some. Um, well, I, I I will go through. I will give some examples of some some harmful ones um, by going through my slides. But first, I will um, uh, respond to. Uh, the comments about um, tricking customers and empowering um, empowering people. Yeah, I, I th there has been a steady move towards this model of um, boosting the financial sector, potentially at the expect of, expense of other parts of the economy. It may be at the expense of foreigners, but it may be expense at the expense of British people, depending on what the kind of activity is. Um, so one of the things that I think is very important here and is really ignored by too many people, um, or at least it's considered not politically acceptable to raise it, is the question of power. It's the question of market power. It's the question of dominance. Um, too big to fail banks are exceptionally dangerous. Um, we have um, found that out with recently with Silicon Valley Bank and um, maybe with Credit Suisse now. Uh, we are having, we are going to have knock, knock on effects of these things. Um, too big to fail banks are extremely powerful. They have the power to not only hold taxpayers to hostage when they need bailouts, but as to go back to the point Andy made about competitiveness, we need to, uh, banks are able to say, you know, don't tax us too much, don't regulate us up too much. Don't make us treat customers too well, or we're going to run away. We, we want to be able to do our activities, make our profits. And if those are predatory activities that harm the economy, then you're going to have to do them or we're going to run away. So it's, a, it's a, like a sort of cosh held over, over, over banks' heads, over politicians' heads. And politicians always run, run around getting frightened when they hear these words. They're worried that, you know, they're going to lose all the financial sector. And so they allow, <laughs> um, you know, that they take taxes off when you know the effects of the crisis are no longer felt so strongly um banks are being detaxed again they're taking regulations are gone um off again there's this package of edinburgh um the edinburgh reforms now coming in there's a deregulatory agenda which is being supported not just by the government obviously but also shamefully by the labor party um there's the financial services and markets bill and they are bringing in a statutory objective for regulators to promote the competitiveness of the UK financial sector. Now, I'm not going to unpack competitiveness now, but basically competitiveness in, in shortest summary is we must do this stuff or all the money will run away. So we need to do all these things we wouldn't really want to do. We wouldn't really want to deregulate. We wouldn't really want to um, stop taxing banks and bankers. But because we're worried it's going to run away, we, we want to stay competitive we're going to do these things that we don't really that the voters certainly hate um so yeah i, I don't know if that's a, perhaps a bit of a mealy mouth response to your question but um i will plow on with my um with my presentation so what are the reasons why too much finance and the wrong kind of finance can harm the economy um uh, i think this idea of extraction is something that's very difficult to get across to the general public but the idea that financial sectors actors are reaching into our pockets and making us poorer, um, it, it, it happens in many different areas. Um, so the most of the, the biggest one in the last couple of decades has been the global financial crisis. Basically, bankers 
made enormous profits. They took huge risks, knowing that they were going to be backstopped by, by taxpayers. And when things went bad, taxpayers had to pay the bill. So they kept their winnings and we paid the price. Um, that is a form of reaching into our pockets. Um, and that's what I would call <coughs> extraction. Ac academics call it rent seeking. Um, and this hap you know, there's various different kinds. There's a lot of tricks that the private equity industry uses, for example, um, which essentially they buy up companies and then they put their sort of drinking straws into these companies and suck out the profits without adding productivity, without, you know, they do sometimes add product productive things to these companies, but very often it's um, some of the most predatory ones are just pure extraction, pure milking. And you end up with care companies that have been bought out by these kinds of players um, and they are just, um, you know, the, the, the care workers have to work a lot harder. The patients get worse service because they've been sucking this money out of financial players have been sucking money out of the real economy. So that's a very big part of it. Um, sorry, I've gone too far ahead. I, I think another crucial element of the city of London, and it's something that I write about extensively in Treasure Islands and, and the Finance Coast book, and that's how Britain has set itself up as a global centre for dirty money, not just the city of London itself, but a lot of these tax havens around the UK, um, British tax havens, overseas territories and crown dependencies like the British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Jersey, Guernsey, Isle of Man. Um, these are kind of collecting vessels for financial activity and a lot of it gets fed up to the city of London. Now, the city of London and lobby organizations like the City UK would say, well, look, this brings so many, um, you know, the, the fees that we earn from handling this dirty money, you know, from corrupt Brazilian politicians or Nigerian leaders or, or <coughs> you know, American mafiosi, this money comes to the city of London, it makes us, it makes us richer. Um, and Russian oligarchs, of course. But I think I and many others would argue that this is a, this is this poses very severe national security threats to the UK. So the city of London will say, look, we've got this sort of positive money, the money coming in, we're handling it, we're getting fees and people are getting jobs and tax revenues from this. They completely airbrush brush out the real damage, which is national security damage, corrupting um, not only foreign countries and helping oligarchs and who knows how they're getting hooks into into our political system. Um, but they're doing it in a completely unmeasurable way. So it's very hard to see this damage. And when the city UK and lobbying organizations put out their data, look how much, you know, jobs and tax revenues and so on, trade surplus um, that the city provides, they always airbrush out all this other collateral damage, this extraction, the national security. Um, tax avoidance is another interesting one. Um, there has been a lot of reporting about how um, UK banks have been helping multinational firms and others avoid escape paying tax. Um, and so the city UK will put out data on how much tax these banks are paying, but they will airbrush out. This is the tax that's also being extracted thanks to these players. So this is all stuff that is in the harmful, in the white part of the egg, in the harmful part of the egg. Um, and of course, lots of other sort of uh, social harms flow from this um, increasing inequality, um, and political corruption are obvious ones. Um, and as I mentioned, the Dutch disease, this is the idea of, of you know, large inflows of financial money from, or, or large inflows of, of large net financial inflows into the country can have an impact on local price levels. The most obvious one is house prices. So when you have oligarchs buying um, expensive flats in London, um, they are crowding out ordinary people prices are going up is this a benefit to the uk money coming in well depends who you are if you're the rich person selling the house yes it's a benefit but if you're someone trying to get on the housing ladder uh, no it's going to have the opposite effect and as i mentioned before the same brain drain that i saw in in africa um as uh you know talented people are sucked out of other sectors and attracted into better paid jobs um and political capture now, there's another element that I put here called um, monopolization damage to smaller media and enterprises. Um, this is something I hope we can discuss a little bit afterwards as well. Um, I, the Balanced Economy Project, which is the organization I co-founded recently, is an anti-monopoly organization. And we are um, starting to look into how um, uh, we have, as a society, in the UK and in other countries, we've kind of lost sight of corporate power. You've had enormous train of mergers and acquisitions over recent decades, 
particularly since the 1990s. Banks have been getting bigger and bigger, swallowing up their competitors, Amazon steamrolling everything, um, big oil companies, big pharmaceutical companies. And around them, there's a whole kind of um, a sort of subservient ecosystem of smaller and medium, medium enterprises that kind of trapped in their gravitational pull. And you're increasingly getting a monopolized economy. Um, and I think that um, UK financial policies, policies towards the financial sector, particularly ones that seek to de deregulate, that particularly ones that are promoting competitiveness, um, they are worsening this problem of monopolization because they are tending to favor the bigger financial players. They're tending to favor the incumbents, the big dominant banks, and this is worsening monopolization. Um, and um, uh, this slide, shows that there are very various ways in which the financial sector, this is another impact of this, another harmful impact, is not only is the financial sector too big to fail, banks um, monopolize themselves. The finance is a, is a heavily, um, a sector with a lot of market power in it. And I think a lot of people who have been engaged with Transparency Task Force will know this in, in, at a visceral level that you know SMEs and um, other players and individuals have been really um, given a bad, bad deal at the hands of very, very dominant and powerful um, financial institutions. So that's monopolization in the financial sector, but the financial sector is also a driver of monopolization in other parts of the economy. There is <coughs> mergers and acquisitions departments of big um, investment banks. They're not just passive facilitators um, of mergers, which increase market power in other sectors, they are actively encouraging it. They're sort of scanning the horizon for deals and putting, assembling together companies um, and building market power like that. They are also financing, um, uh, you know, throwing cheap finance at big players. You know, Amazon will have no trouble um, borrowing as much money as it likes at very cheap terms, but try being someone competing against Amazon and you will struggle to get any banker to lend anything to you at anything reasonable. Um, and so there's lots of, lots of kind of um, damage to competition. Um, this is just an il illustration, just a visual illustration of, of the rise of market power in the UK banking sector. Um, okay, so I did want to talk now about competitiveness, um, but before going on, are there any further comments at this st stage? Are we okay? It looks like we're good. All right. Yeah, we'll have a Q&A and discussion a bit when he gets to the end of this slide. Thank you. Yeah. So competitiveness is something that it's, it's if you're looking to reform um, the UK financial sector, you have to understand how important this is. Um, it is something that was all over the political language of financial regulation before the last global financial crisis. And then when the crisis hit, there was quite widespread um, recognition that competitiveness had been this idea to sort of, you know, this competition between New York and London. And London was always trying to sort of, there was this kind of race to the bottom going on. London was always trying to stay a step ahead of New York. We'll be even more deregulated than them. So bring your financial activity, your risky stuff over here. Um, <coughs> we will, um, you know, allow even more tax loopholes. We will allow you, we won't police, you know, there was, there was an awful lot of um, talk of not wanting to enforce the law too hard, not wanting to police the financial sector. I, I, uh, there was a, a, a financial detective um, called Rowan Bosworth Davis who said he was sitting at a, at a big dinner with big bankers and he gave a speech about enforcement and stuff like that. And he said when he sat down afterwards, um, he had uh, one of the senior bankers turn to him and said, if you think any of us are ever going to go to, go to jail, you're very much mistaken. We are a protected species. And I think that's pretty, <laughs> pretty well accepted. I mean, um, with almost no exception, enforcement actions and um, you know penalties against banks and bankers, um, even against UK banks and bankers, tend to come from Americans. It tends to be the Americans who are enforcing the law when it touches the United States in some way. Um, very, very much, much less enforcement. If you look at the sort of fines and and so on. Um, very little has come from the UK. The UK enforcement is a very weak enforcement, and that is competitive. That's what they call competitive. Deliberately not enforcing the law so as not to frighten the money away. Um, and again, it raises the question of whether this is good for us. So competitiveness came in 
big time before the global financial crisis. They were all talking about it. Then the crisis hit, it was discredited, and they took it out of the financial regulatory le lexicon. And now, in the last, uh, how long would you say, Andy, six months, um, a bit more, it has come back. And now, um, with these reforms, UK financial regulators are going to get a, a mandate, a statutory mandate to promote what they call the competitiveness and growth of, and, and, and it's very badly defined. Um, I've looked into what they actually mean by that, but they do not define it very ac accurately. What this means in effect is boosting the City of London competitiveness, but is, the aim is to boost the City of London, and if that's at the expense of other parts of the UK economy, then uh, so be it. Hang on, the objective says, and to the benefit of the UK economy, it does yes, say that. And indeed, and and I would, and one of the key things about competitiveness is that they put competitiveness and growth in this box. You see that in the in the quotes there, competitiveness and growth. They put it together. Yeah. But what they mean by competitiveness um, will stand in opposition to growth. It, it, it's this kind of paradox again. Um, if you grow the financial sector in a competitive way, what they mean by competitiveness. Um, in this kind of race to the bottom way, you will ultimately harm economic growth. So it's a rhetorical attaching competitiveness to growth. But in reality, what it's going to do is it's going to damage growth. It's going to increase inequality. It's going to increase, you know, uh, dirty money and, and national security risk. And all, all these kinds of things are going to flow from competitiveness. And you've had a train of former financial regulators of, of people who are, you know, in the front line of the last global financial crisis coming out in the newspapers in the last few months saying don't do this don't do this don't do this um, and yet they're going ahead with it one of the really difficult things to wrestle with, with competitiveness is that it sounds great doesn't it i mean who would be against competitiveness it just sounds brilliant but and it's really hard to unpack it's quite complicated they don't define it very well um in fact they define define it terribly and if anybody's interested i can send some materials on that um, and it's just being steamrolled through. And Labour seems to think it's a good idea, even though Labour was at the helm when the last global financial crisis hit, and they know very well what the effect of competitiveness was. So it's all rather disappointing. Um, and so, yeah, let me go on. So this is, um, again, we don't have too much time left, but um, there has been, there was a, 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 an economist letter from a bunch of world famous economists um, that basically said, there is no place anywhere for competitiveness in the financial regulatory toolkit. And I like this quote from Paul Krugman. This actually came from a, uh, an old article he wrote in the 1990s um, called Competitiveness, a Dangerous Obsession, which became a very famous article. And he said a government wedded to the ideology, ideology of competitiveness is an unlikely to make good economic policy as a government committed to creationism is to make good science policy. Um, we don't have time to get into the details of it now. But um, suffice to say that once you start unpacking what does competitiveness mean when applying it to a fi financial sector, the whole concept kind of falls apart in your hands. It's economists know it's economic nonsense. It's one thing for a firm to compete in a market, but for a whole country or for a sector to compete, it's all about um, it's all about uh, basically boosting one sector at the expense of other sectors. So I'm sorry that I'm going a little bit quickly here. I've kind of got to the conclusions now and um, I'm really gonna rush through this to give you a chance for a bit more discussion. Um, so going back to what Andy says, you know, there is this narrative, the city of London is the goose that lays the golden eggs, our financial center, we mustn't touch it. Um, it creates all these jobs and so on. And if we tax it too much, if we regulate it too much, it's all gonna run away um, <laughs> and we'll all be poorer. But the key point of the finance curse, I think, is its narrative power. I think um, we do need, you know, this is a story. The goose that lays the golden eggs is a story that so many people in Britain believe. And we need another story to overturn. And I believe that the finance curse by saying, if you shrink, if you get rid of, you know, if you police the city of London properly to crack down on financial crime, if you prevent it from spreading monopolization and being monopolized, if you tax it properly, all of these things are benefits to the UK. And even though the city of London will be smaller, the UK as a whole, the economy will be more prosperous. It will be more equal. It will be less conflicted. It will be less corrupt. And I think the, the, the narrative of power of the finance curse is something that we can really work with. And I'm planning with, with some other um, 
organizations that um uh, that that are interested in this area to do more work in, in this area um, on the finance coast and building the narrative. So here's the shrink finance for prosperity in a picture. Start with big fried egg and move to a more healthy fried egg. And that is the end of my presentation for now. Um, and the finance coast is quite an aggressive framing. It's quite, you know, I think a lot of people would run away from talking about finance curse, but there are other framings as well. Right-sized finance is another one that maybe is more appealing. Yeah. But that's, um, yeah. that's I'm going to stop there, even though I've got a little bit more. But that's that's me. Thank you very much. Uh, Sorry for rushing through it a little bit. Nicholas, thank you very much indeed. You've packed a hell of a lot in there. You really have for us. Thanks very much. We'll go to the Q&A discussion. Before we do that, folks, let's show our appreciation to Nicholas yeah. for sharing with us his insights. It's been very interesting indeed, Nicholas. Thank you. Very, 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 very much. Um, a, 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 one quick question from me, Nicholas. I can't resist asking it, then we'll throw it open to everybody else. I know Tom Shuler wants to come in with some thoughts as well, for example. Um, in the UK, how much of the problem is simply that the banks have got bloody good at lobbying the government to get their way? I mean, how much of it just simply comes down to that the lobbying is too powerful, the government's too to um challenged to resist all those lovely rich donations that they get um how, how much of this is this down to that kind of influence and spin and backroom deals and all that kind of stuff i think obviously it's a very big part of it it's absolutely significant um i think also market power is a very big part of it um just the fact that they are once you are in a dominant position in a niche um you know if you're lending to smes or whatever you have enormous kind of power over them um a lot of it comes to comes to i i think this competitiveness seen as a kind of cost to hold over over politicians head is tremendously powerful um this threat like if you don't do what we want we're going to run away um politicians fall for that one the whole time and I think generally that this whole kind of goose that lays the golden eggs engine of the British economy narrative is so powerful um, that I think that is something that we have to take on if we are going to if we are going to increase our prosperity, improve our our security, improve our you know make us a less unequal place um, regionally and and you know uh, between different sort of income levels. Um, if we want to improve all of these things, we are really going to have to um, overturn this engine of the economy narrative. Otherwise, we're going to become more and more finance dependent. Um, previous Bank of England, England Governor Mark Carney said he thought it would be fine if the UK, if the banking sector was twice as large as it was now. Um, and I think that's a sort of dangerous idea that we need to overturn. And I think the finance curse by showing basically what the finance curse does is it takes all so there's 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 benefits and there's costs from the financial sector and at the moment what's easy to see and what's shown by um by everyone is the benefits and the finance curse says hang on there's a bunch of costs and let's put those into the picture as well um and uh yeah so i think it is you know i think it is a, a powerful narrative that we do need to start developing and i think so that's a very significant part of it Nicholas, thank you very much. We're going to go to Tom Schuler for his reflections. Tom, please take a moment to introduce yourself. It's wonderful to have your support as always. And then we're going to go to Sunil Sharma, who probably is in Washington, DC. I think I'm right there, but let's go to Tom first, who I'm pretty sure is okay. somewhere in the UK. Tom. Well, thanks very much, Andy, and, and thanks, Nicholas. I, I should make clear, I'm not an expert on this issue at all. I'm not an economist. Um, I've just followed the issue a bit and benefited from Treasure Islands and the finance curse and, and uh, a little uh, some other reading. Um, and I everything that Nicholas said made very good sense to me. I, I wanted to uh, ask on a specific area you, which you you touched on, Nicholas, but it was the 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 brain drain issue. That's my area is. Um, labor market, adult learning, lifelong learning, and uh, the, the general issues of, of skills. And I just wonder how we quantify or can give a higher profile to this particular issue. 
if I can just give an absolute classic of a, a, a personal, you know, sample of one anecdote. I remember 30 years ago, talking to my mother's lodger, who was just completing a PhD in physics. Um, and what was he doing? Going into banking. And I, you know, I said to him, how long have you spent doing physics? And he just said, sorry, you know, it's four times the pay. So all the public investment that had supported him through uh, seven years of physics training was going straight into um, fancy derivatives and so on. And, and I saw that you included this. I think it would be really significant if we could uh, flesh that out somehow, um, partly because it politically it taps into the very important issue around productivity, which is of wider public concern and, and provides some more hooks for getting this debate going. So uh, yeah. that, that, that's, that's a really, line in. really important question. I think that is a very valid sort of um, angle of approach. Um, yeah. So the jobs, the jobs issue is um, there have been some studies done out there. I don't think any of them are particularly good. There are some sectors which aren't always described as finance. I think when people think of finance, they think of banking and what you describe there with your friend. I have friends who've done exactly the same thing. And I'm sure other people on the call also have friends who've, you know, studied <laughs> something potentially useful and they've gone into, you know, banking and whatever. Mm. Um, I think there are some, I'm very interested in the private equity industry and what the private equity in sector is basically, um, uh, private equity firms go in and buy out companies that are doing productive things. Um, they go off and buy a company, I don't know, making paper or, 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 or telephones or something like that. And then they will financially re-engineer it. They may re-engineer it in a good way. They may introduce better management techniques they may introduce new investment for you know research and develop, development and so on but very often what they do is they introduce financial engineering so they say this company okay you are paying you too much tax here so let's put your financial affairs through some tax havens and we'll cut out the tax bill they may say okay you're paying you, your 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 salaries too high let's get rid of a bunch of workers and the remaining ones can work harder and um <laughs> their lives may be harder but but so what they may say <laughs> um you are treating your suppliers too fairly let's get aggressive with them bring in some lawyers to do that um all of this none of this is is and there's a bunch of other things there are some tricks that they use the dividend recapitalization um sale and leaseback operations that are literally what i was saying sort of sucking putting a straw in and just sucking money out um so this is so this is a kind of it, it, it's like a it, it's related to the brain drain because the private equity executives themselves very often are people who are very good at running companies um they they have trained you know they've got mbas and they know how to run companies they know how to do companies better but they're being turned away by the financial logic um to doing these other activities that they could be doing um and i'm not aware of any studies that really have tried to quantify that and i think it would be quite difficult to sort of work out who's doing good stuff and who, who's doing bad stuff so i think it's always going to be very imprecise but i think it is a very very important issue um, is it something that you tom are kind of that you is this an area that you you study and you no no i mean only in the very broad macro sense of, right. of how do we raise the the levels of human capital, if you like. Yeah. And what I've been trying to do is, is, is people always focus just on, as it were, the supply side, how do we train more people? And I've been looking at the reward side, how, who gets what rewards for the skills that they gain? I've been looking at particularly in relation to women and the uh, qualifications they get and how under recognized and under rewarded they are. Mm -hmm. which is a different mm -hmm. issue but but the, the debate yeah. doesn't cover doesn't generally cover the reward systems for skills and th and that's where yeah. there's an overlap with what very much an overlap with what you're talking about yeah i i totally agree i i think it's very important um how, how much time do we have now are we sorry <laughs> we're getting a little tight the time so just yes, we go to say well that's happy to talk a bit Thank longer you. If I, I, I also think Tom's point is massive. Um, the, the, the question is, 
what is the opportunity cost of somebody becoming, let's say, a derivative trader as opposed to an engineer, for argument's sake? That's a massively important question, and I don't know what the answers are. Um, perhaps that ought to be some more energy into that. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, Sunil, please take a moment to please introduce yourself and make your point. Thank you. Um, hi, Andy. I, I am in Washington, D.C., but given you're running out of time, let me just say quickly that the, 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 the point that Tom uh, and Nicholas raised is, is, is much broader. Um, I mean, I can give you many examples of kids who went to the top schools from here in the Washington area, uh, wanting to become neurosurgeons and then came, came out as hedge fund managers. Uh, but anyway, quantifying that is very, very difficult, but it's really a systemic problem. Um, if we don't have enough funding for the physics PhDs to actually not have to uh, be associated with universities for six or 10 years before they can actually get a professor appointment, um, so, so, so it, it, it comes back to, are we funding our universities, how we are providing incentives for people to remain to be physicists? Um, but anyway, that's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that many of the issues that Nicholas uh, makes are, are much broader. It's not, not just related to the financial sector, but much more in terms, we have to look at it in terms of systemic <laughs> corporate power. Um, so we've done some work recently for the UN um, where we look at the inter interrelationships between um, uh, um, governments and the political players, the corporate sector, and then civil society. And, and these interactions um, are really determined in, in many ways about how we can oversee the corporations and the financial sector. So this is really is a systemic issue. Um, and we can't have a conversation on, on this because regulating the financial sector is a political activity. It requires political power to actually uh, preempt or enforce certain kinds of rules, as we've said that enforcement is, is, is weak. Um, so I think this is not just fina uh, finance related, but a much bigger systemic issue that we, we need to look at. Um, and we can't divorce the economics from the politics. So. Yeah, that's agree with you. Yeah. Thank you, Sol. Let's go to Ian, then we'll jump back to Nicholas for some sort of final thoughts. Then we'll just um, keep the conversation going for those that for those that want to. Uh, this is a rich, a very very rich theme we've tapped into today. Uh, thanks, Sol. Ian. Yeah. The only the only comments you made, Nick, where I might push back a little are that I do think there has been quite a lot of improvement in a couple of areas in behaviour of the finance industry. The two areas in particular, money laundering. I really do think that. With the, the trigger of 9-11, uh, and as a result of that, the Americans finally took, you know, money laundering seriously. And as a result, the whole world took money laundering seriously. So, you know, the reality is uh, all the, you know, the regulators, it's right at the top of their agenda of dealing with all the banks. So uh, I I think certainly in London, uh, anti-money laundering is is right at the top of most financial firms agendas you know financial crime is taken seriously uh, and then i think the other area where i think that's also changed is although it changed a few years later was um tax avoidance i mean before the financial crash in 2007 you know it, all of the big banks had massive structuring departments whose whole job was to do uh massive ta tax structured deals mainly with between UK in the UK banks it was mainly with the US because it was to arbitrage UK US tax and the US tax authorities absolutely knew about it in fact the US government actually encouraged the UK US corpus to get involved I don't think the UK government was quite as knowing in it but the reality is as part of the saving the banks uh, one of the things that all the UK banks signed up to was that they wouldn't take part in that sort of activity going forward so the you know, they closed all of those departments. And, and so UK banks now wouldn't knowingly uh, do tax avoidance like they did in the past, if you know what I mean. I'm not saying that they've never inadvertently helped a customer who's who's got a tax strategy, but 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 they wouldn't set up artificial structures like they used to. So I think there has been some quite significant changes in the last 20 years. Yes, I would tend to I would tend to agree that it's an area that I've followed quite closely. And in both cases in money laundering, I mean, and certainly with the, you know, since the Ukraine law, Ukraine war, um, there has been, you know, that has given it an impetus. There has been there have been a lot of international um, pressures that have yeah, improved but, money but laundering. Factor, in factor lots of is countries. the biggest single one for tax avoidance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, there's another whole story. There's another whole tale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but yes, it's it's true that, that there have been some very significant improvements, and I have been, as well as a journalist, a campaigner in this area, and we have seen many improvements internationally. Um, whether the UK has improved relative to other countries, you can have a debate about that. Um, but with the with the current government, we are now seeing not in the money laundering area and not not really in the tax area, tax avoidance area, but certainly in the financial regulation area, you are seeing an undoing of that. So you had an improvement after the crisis, a lot of public pressure, better regulation. And now um, we're getting a retreat. We're going back to sort of memories of, of the crisis are fading and we're going back to a lot of the, um, you know, with competitiveness coming in, we go, we're going to go back to in the direction of, of the sort of negative past. So it's something we need to push against. But I, I take your point, you're quite right. Um, but again, with some nuance. Thank you, everyone, for your contribution so far. Let's just check in. Does anybody else have anything else that they would like to come in with before we start bringing the session to a close? As I mentioned in the chat, if anybody else wants to carry on talk, we, we certainly can. Tom, you want to come back well, in again? I just remember just a thought that came to my mind. Oh, but sorry, back to the brain drain issue, but but trying to say how does one take it forward? I mean, the the respective, whether they're learned societies or professional bodies, I just wonder what connections might be put to them uh, to say, uh, do you have either just information on or views on the destinations of your graduates, scholars, and so on? So as it were to, uh, I don't know if there's a Royal Physics Society of Physicists, but there's certainly be a professional body of physicists, but also engineers and so on, to actually ask them, whether they know about the proportions of their graduates or not just young graduates, but people who leave mid-career uh, and find their destination in the finance sector rather than carrying on um, in their own, as, as we would think, more productive area. So sort of handful of bodies like the Royal Societies or the professional bodies might be, an, that might be something to explore. That's a really good point, and I'm actually going to take that on board. Um, yeah. I'd be if if you were Tom were able to send me an email and um, via Andy on that. Um, if you have some, yeah, it's it's an interesting one that I I would like to. Yeah, that's a really good yeah. Yeah. good idea. I'll, I'll I'll happily connect you. Um, I'm wondering about how that could be framed. Well, it's about the product productivity, the use of professional competences yeah. and skills. Yes, yeah. I mean you could. Try, I, I don't suppose educational institutions, universities would be able to track their graduates, but um, working out. Some where, of them do, uh, but I think you're probably better off with a sort of, you know, discipline or professional area because yeah. that would be of, of more concern to them. Yeah. 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 Fascinating stuff. Fascinating. We're going to go to Martin White. Then I think Ian Taylor's, Tyler's put his hand up again. Uh, Martin. Um, thank you, Andy. Um, <clears throat> on the. Uh, professional training i'm an actuary but i did i did electrical engineering degree and i could not have done a degree more suitable to becoming an actuary um i believe that engineering is one discipline that it helps hugely if you've studied it before your work um and i i think there ought to be way 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 more um training of engineers in the uk so that's one that's one thing um i don't believe i i wasn't being disloyal to engineering when i did it i, I knew what my skills were <laughs> um but i found it hugely relevant and i it gives me an angle on things that my rest of my profession doesn't have um so that i found that a, a big thing um if it's okay nicholas i would really like to chat with you one to one after this sure yes um andy can give you my email and yeah. Oh, absolutely. So that, that would be brilliant. It just happens that the things that I've been, the pennies that have been dropping over my lifetime um, about how companies work and that sort of thing, and then how individuals get ripped off and how they're linked together, um, they seem to be incredibly close to the points that you're making. Um, okay. I believe okay. national, okay. national strategy is, is, is a very important thing to consider. And I put a little thing in the chat I mean, I regard the tragedy of capitalism as the fact that it's very hard for a company to be run for the long term um, and not get taken over. 
which yeah. is why my biggest asset is Berkshire Hathaway, and I'm very happy with it. Hmm. Yes, Warren Buffett is a bit of a monopolist, but but still, <laughs> um, yes. We can talk about that. <laughs> we can talk about that, yes. So okay, sure. It's been a brilliant good. session, and thank you very much indeed. Thanks. I can see there's a lot of comments on the chat here. Wow. Okay. The, the reference to Warren Buffett makes me think about um, Charlie Munger with his very famous quote, um, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. So I'm just imagining being, let's say, a 22-year-old recently graduating engineer or physicist or whatever, and I've got two career paths ahead of me. One is engineering, physics, earning, let's say, 50k a year. The other is go and create some derivatives that are going to, that are going to wreck the planet and society for twice as much money. What a dilemma that would be. Don't be so um, negative about derivatives, <laughs> <laughs> Andy. Uh, actually, I, I just, my last comment, I just wanted to maybe spend a minute just thinking about, so why is it that London is such a, so big in financial services? And, and deep down, I think it is because there is an element of when you look at what are our competitive advantages as a country, it, it does tend to lead us a bit that way because the the single probably the single biggest advantage I would actually argue is our legal system. You know, our our judges are very very respected in in other countries, and the fact that we have a common law legal system is infinitely more flexible than the European version of law, which is one of the I would argue one of the reasons Brexit's happened because it's much easier now to do things in London than it would have been when we were under European law. So there's the legal system. Language is obviously incredibly helpful because uh, like English is the, uh, a, a mode. Of, and, and then you've got times, the time frame, you know, the time yeah. zone we're okay. in is incredibly helpful. We had, That's why London is the main trading venue for certain things, purely because of time. We, you know, uh, and once you add those things up and then you get, a then you get this, and then, of course, the bit that you're struggling with is once you get a group of things together, it actually attracts others in because you've got all the support yeah. services, you've got the accountants that actually understand the lawyers, the, you know, and, and and so it sort of has got self-sustaining momentum. And there are yeah. really yeah. cities on Earth like that. London and New York are the only two cities. You know, other countries have financial centres, but nothing like London or or New York. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think those those elements you're talking about are the yellow part of the fried egg, the sort of, you know, good, good, strong legal systems and so on. Um, yeah. Uh, one other thing that you missed out. Yeah. Um, which and education. <laughs> and education. One, one other crucial factor, and I would say probably the most important factor is empire. Um, the British choice, empire, right? was, empire. The British Empire was the heart of that was the sort of finance pumping heart of of, you know, the, the British you know, the city of London was was the financing pumping heart of the city of the British Empire. And after um, when the empire came apart, sort of from the from the mid 50s onwards, um, you still had this enormous kind of um, uh, it was both uh, a, a, a load of people with skills, mm. a load of people with contacts. It was a vested interest in the country that was very politically strong, that was able to look after its own interests. But they also made this flip from being the sort of handler of the Brit British Empire to um, uh, what was called the euro dollar market. Now, yeah. the euro, euro dollar market was um, essentially a non-resident market. It was we are going to be the center for handling international money and we are going to take. So the Americans had very strong after the Second World War. Um, there was the Bretton Woods institutions, there were very strong financial regulations and, you know, financial cross-border speculation and so on was very heavily suppressed under this Bretton Woods framework and it was financial rep repression and bankers hated it. Um, this was a period of some of the highest and most broad-based economic growth in world history before or since. Um, that period of the sort of roughly quarter century after the Second World War, when there was this very heavy suppression of finance. And the British <coughs> euro dollar market was basically an escape route from that. So it was allowing people who weren't allowed to do stuff in the in the United United States, for example, American bankers piled into London because you know they had you know regulations at home that were crimping their profits. They didn't like them, but they knew that if they could come to London, the Bank of England would basically treat this stuff in the euro dollar market as non-resident stuff that they weren't going to regulate it 
weren't going to regulate. So it was a very sort of offshore, unregulated market. It was catering to others. And the Russians came in, you know, in the Cold War and put their money in London. And that was um, a kind of replacement for empire. So you have, you know, you have not only this sort of huge sort of financial interest grew up in the United Kingdom um, during empire, but when that um, when that sort of came to, came to an end um, uh, with the Bretton Woods system and after the Second World War and so on, and when decolonization happened, and it was no longer automatically the sort of international turntable for, for the money of the colonies, it changed this new model, this kind of offshore deregulated model, the, the, the so-called euro dollar market. I wrote about it in Treasure Island. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a very interesting historical trajectory that the UK has taken. And I think the power of kind of historical, yeah. um, you know, the, the 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 staying power of a historical vested interest is a very very hard thing to dislodge. And I think that political power of the financial sector will continue to keep it going forward and will continue to influence the Labour Party, who should be opposing competitiveness, but instead they are, for reasons best known to themselves, making welcome noises to this deregulation. Yeah. Business. I, 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 I want to pick up on that, Nicholas, if I may. So, so TTF is is um, not politically aligned. You know, we just think about the consumer society generally. So, we're not politically aligned. You would normally think, wouldn't you, that um, major concerns about a financial sector sort of getting carried away with itself, being very polite, getting carried away with itself, um, would be kind of you know the, the checks and balances of that would be that occasionally you'd go from a Conservative Party government to let's say a Labour Party government. And the Labour Party government would behave like a Labour Party government and think differently to the Conservatives. But all the evidence at the moment seems to suggest that the Labour Party is um, up for the very ideas that have the potential to um, to become highly problematic. So let me turn into a question for you, Nicholas. So given your thoughts in practical kind of campaigning terms, where, where should our attention be? What should our focus be? Whoa. Um, okay, I'm not a campaign strategist, but I am learning about campaign strategy. I think um, I just saw a poll coming out saying that the Labour lead has dropped substantially um, in the last little while. So sort of 10 points. I don't know how representative that is. But that, I saw that this morning. Um, <laughs> I think most people still are, are thinking that the Conservatives probably now are unelectable for quite a long time. Um, and so Labour is going to come into power. Um, and so I think a lot of people trying to influence for the long term are thinking about the Labour Party and how to influence the Labour Party. Um, so I think that is a good bet to go after the Labour Party um, and try and influence them. And I think now they are going through a period of reflection. They're still working out. You know, I think their personality is fairly well established in terms of their sort of approach to this stuff. But I think they're always, you know, they're on a period of looking for good ideas. So I think, you know, they are obviously worth worth focusing on um the conservatives yeah um i think i don't know i think i think one thing that has really changed since the last crisis i think when the last crisis hit we were in the phase of what some people call tina which stands for t-i-n-a there is no alternative in other words there was a sort of worldview we should be like this we should have competitiveness we should have um (laughs) you know cutting taxes and deregulating and stuff that was the 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 sort of common sense wisdom that everybody all the chattering classes were saying um what's different now is that if there's another crisis coming tina has gone we do have some alternatives and i think um taking an advantage taking advantage if you know if there if there is a crisis it'd be very unfortunate for very many people but i think it will be an opportunity to bring some ideas that have been kind of um, incubating now for quite some time. And that's the difference from the last crisis. There were no alternatives idea that had sort of broad mainstream credibility, and now there are. So I think we are in an interesting time. And I think people are very sort of sick of um, what you might call trickle down. Just, um, could, you, could you, could you, Nicholas, could you give, if, if I said to you, what are the, so what are the top three recommendations? You know, you've got your, you've got your 18 seconds in the lift. What, what what are the top two or three um, rec- actual recommendations? And by the way, can I just say, although I think the finance curse is completely uh, accurate as a label and uh, very striking, um, I th- 
politically, it's a little difficult for, I would think, even for even the Labour Party to fly under the finance curse. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they, yeah. they, they've got a constraint. So I can't remember what your the other label did. Was it the right size or yeah, right sized finance was just an idea that I had. It, it, um, but I I'm, think that I think that that is a lot more manageable politically yeah. than yeah. something that if if you know for them to sign up to the finance curse as a slogan to go under is yes. going to sink their chances of. Uh, you know, they're just not going to do it because it, of the yeah. alienating effect on. I, I know, you know I know. It's finance curse speaks to I, certain I, I, people. I, I, it was great yeah. title for a book, very convincing, but not the best one to approach yeah. um, a political party, probably with. I, I but right-sized economy, you know, a lot better or yeah. something like that. Anyway, that's yeah. that. It's just saying, you know, are, is it is it drop the competitiveness criterion? Is it is it um, I don't know what the, what the top two are. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're asking a very big question because we're talking about the sort of the heart of the economy really now. What are the top three recommendations for the heart of the economy? Um, tactically, uh, the finance people that I've been working with and Andy's been working with um, have gone very hard on the competitiveness thing. We think that... <laughs> in the sort of medium term, it may be possible. I think we had successes. They were talking about trying to make competitiveness a primary objective. Mm. Now it's looking mm. like it's going to be a yeah, secondary. secondary. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that is partly a campaigning win. I think without campaigning, there probably would have been, or possibly would have been a primary objective. So, but I think, you know, it, there is no silver bullet, obviously, um, but I think what is actually important is for people in different in very different silos to come together and say we're suffering from the same thing um, and getting sort of organizing across different different areas. So people in the care sector um, may be suffering the same particular issues. We can look at particular issues that you know, financial engineering tricks that are also being used in, I don't know, the, 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 the tourism sector or something yeah, like I that. Yeah, I mean, the, the FT magazine, I think it was this last weekend or possibly that uh, carried a very good piece by a woman whose mother had worked for 45 years yeah. in the care sector. Private equity had come in and um, you know, it was, an F, it was a, a very soundly based FT piece and I thought it made the point very well about... When, what, when did that come out? I'd, I think I missed that. I would like not, to... Like, I I think it was, uh, it was either this last weekend or the weekend before in the FT magazine, okay. the, the weekend magazine. Uh, okay. I, in fact, it must have been, I must have been this weekend. I probably, I may even have it somewhere. But yeah, I tried to actually, me and some colleagues tried to do a um, uh, a piece about private equity. And we, we spoke to, you know, a care worker who who experienced being taken over by big firm and um we tried to write it but we got such ferocious libel letters from yeah. ruck which is a very nasty firm yeah. um yeah. that we eventually had to say almost nothing um mm. and that's another whole story that relates well, to competitiveness like, they're yeah. making london um friendly for oligarchs so strong libel laws that will allow yeah. you know the story recently about the head of wagner um prigozhin yeah. Yeah. Um, suing British journalists and getting, you know, official encouragement to do so is an example. You know, we want to make life comfortable for olig oligarchs. Is this good for the country? Um, it is certainly competitive libel law um, because it will attract oligarchs. But is it good for the country is another question. Um, and so you can look at competitiveness in so many different angles. You, know, you can look at it from that perspective and from many other perspectives. Um, and I think organizing to um, organizing is absolutely key to this and organizing to sort of join, show people in different parts of the economy that we're all in the same kind of, you know, facing the same issue and coming together on specific projects. I guess it's my, I don't know, it's my, if you ask me to give two or three recommendations, that's my sort of simplest answer. But I could, you know, we could all think of many things and TTF has been talked about many things that need to be done. But I do think that um, if we just focus on the behavior, you know, um, people getting screwed over by big financial institutions, if we just focus on behavior and activities or what's going on, we may miss the big picture. I think we do need to focus on the power, the actual power of what's going on. So financial regulation is one way of getting at that power. Um, competition policy is another way of getting at that power. You know, are banks too big? Should we break them up?
big question, not politically possible at the moment, but maybe one day this will come onto the come onto the radar. And uh, yeah, how can we how can we go after the power directly? And I think that's um, that's absolutely crucial. We're going to go to Martin in a moment. Just one quick comment about uh, slaps. Um, slaps are where um, people are being suppressed effectively from using their rights under free speech, uh, where, where the powerful and the wealthy inhibit people speaking out about things. It's obviously a bit of an, an anathema to an organisation like the Transparency Task Force. We've had first-hand experience of this now because we're actively criticising particular um, organisations and we're starting to feel the heat of slaps. It's interesting, really interesting. The reason I mention it is because it's such a big issue that we are going to be running an event about it. And there are a few journalists we're pretty well connected to who are really keen to have a chance to say what they think about what's going on in this space. Um, it's definitely one of those asymmetry of power situations that we need to challenge and fight against. We're going to go to Martin, he's got a quick point to make, then I'm going to go back to Nicholas for his final thoughts. Um, and it's been a great session, Nicholas, thank you. Martin, to you. Okay, here we, here we go. Um, there's two points, but they're very, very, very quick. There's, no one's just cropped up. Um, the more general one, which is, I believe that within the political world, there are a number of really good people on all parties. You just got to get hold of them and quietly chat to them. I mean, I, I say that of all parties. Um, uh, the, the other thing is, uh, Nicholas was looking for, let's call it, what's the Achilles heel of the financial sector? How can you start having an impact? That's precisely what the work I'm doing is trying to attack. Um, so if you if you look at my stuff, you'll get an idea. Martin, thank you very much. That's the most succinct you've ever, ever been. Wonderful. I, I, is, I, I, is, I, I won't allow you to get with that. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think Sunil's itching to come in with a point. Are you, Sunil? Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just going to make a recommendation for a good yeah, read. Yeah. Um, Gary Gersel, who's professor um, of American history at Cambridge University, just put out this book on the rise and fall of the neoliberal order. And where he's talking about how, at least in the United States, um, you know, we had the coming of the New Deal, um, how the New Deal gave way to the neoliberal order, and now why the neoliberal order has failed. And we are looking at uh, uh, the emergence of a new political order. Um, and I think it's, it, it in some sense um, addresses some of the issues that, that Nicholas has raised, and I said in, in a much broader political context. Um, because I think after 1980, once we had the stagflation of the US, the certain assumptions underlying the way policy was conducted changed, right? This was the beginning of uh, uh, the neoliberal order, the market dominance, uh, the deregulation, um, and the emergence of corporate power uh, to the extent that we had never seen over the last 100 years in, in, in US history. Um, and this is what it has brought, uh, brought us to. Uh, and now, hopefully, if the institutions hold, we will be having a reaction going back to um, the kinds of discussions we had uh, in, in the 60s and 70s, whether it's about labor power, unionization, representation, um, and the distortion that we've been talking about in our educational systems, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So I think the, the, the background politics of what, what is going on is quite nicely captured by Gary. Um, and I had this interview with him, which the IMF wanted me to summarize. So that's what um, I, I, I've posted. But I think that the, the, the context is very, very important both in terms of politics and competition. Thank you, Sarah. This has been a very interesting conversation. M Martin Wolf has come up a few times in the slides, um, in the chat. We had an event with Martin a few weeks ago. It was really good. I loved it. The best bit was when he said, and he wasn't being literal, was when he said if he could, he would blow up the Treasury. He wasn't being literal. He was speaking about the Treasury's influence on the, on the system. Uh, Martin, it was good to hear Martin will say that. Mr. Nicholas Saxon, I'm going to pass back to you for your sort of final comments. Then I'm going to I'm going to respond to Tom's question about what would we do? What should be you know the three things we should really focus on? Just to leave you some passing thoughts, folks. Nicholas, back to you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I'm actually going to. I mean, there's so many ways I could end, but I I'm actually just going to throw back a question to anybody, and if they want to get in touch or or put comments on the chat here, the finance curse to me seems like. A pretty obvious thing. I, I don't think anyone would disagree with the framing of the fri fried egg. There's beneficial parts and harmful parts of the financial sector. Um, 
it hasn't really, as an idea, my, my previous book, Treasure Island, was much more successful than my book, The Finance Curse. I mean, I think partly it's because of the way it was written, but I think the idea of The Finance Curse hasn't got the traction that I think it deserves. And I think other people have said that it does deserve more traction. I think it is potentially a very potent narrative. Um, I agree with the framing. I agree with the name, the finance goes being a problem, but any thoughts that anybody has about, and I think looking at you know jobs and how this all works out is a very potent way to do it, but any thoughts on <laughs> useful ways to break through politically to voters, to journalists, to politicians, um, always interested in hearing your thoughts. So those are my passing, my, my um, sort of summarizing conclusion slash question. And thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Nicholas, thank you. Um, my, my sort of three thoughts here are as follows. Uh, the first would be uh, the removal of the competitiveness agenda. It is absolutely foolish for the primary conduct regulator to be given an objective, which is to act as a cheerleader for the City of London. A six-year-old can see the fundamental conflict of interest. Uh, the problem we've got, of course, is that, as somebody said in the chat, you know, the, our worlds of finance and politics are very closely intertwined in this country. That's why such a stupid idea is being given the airtime that it doesn't even deserve. So we have to fight back against that competitiveness agenda. Having a regulator as a cheerleader is, is like having, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, like, it's like having um, the referee of a football match tasked with scoring a goal. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, does it? Uh, the, the second point is that the idea of a legally enforceable duty of care. People in the UK are held back from getting justice and compensation when they are harmed by the financial sector because we do not have a legally enforceable duty of care. That's something TGS working really hard with lots of parliamentarians about in the current financial services and markets bill. And my third one is actually going to become an advert for one of our next upcoming meetings. Uh, Positive Money, one of the great organisations we are very proud to be associated with and to work with from time to time. They've done some superb work on the power of big finance, which speaks to all that stuff about lobbying. They've done a great report and get some really good research. We've got an event with Positive Money all about that work on the 2nd of May. So pencil it in folks, 2nd of May, Positive Money and the work on the power of big finance. If you want to really see how um, powerful the lobbying is in the UK, by the banks and other such financial institutions then make sure you don't miss that event. I'd like to propose we all put our hands together to thank Nicholas for his wonderful session and his insights and I've really enjoyed not just the conversations around Nicholas, Nicholas as his points but also all the dialogue and the interaction around it. Thank you all very very much indeed for being here. As you all know we're a pretty under-resourced organisation but we're always fighting above our, our weight and we'll continue to do that because of the the goodwill and the energy that we are getting back from our community. So thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, folks. Cheers. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks very much.